the kings of the earth, his judgment of some, his blessing on others to get his word to us. Up here beside me is an attempt at an exact facsimile copy of the first King James Bible that came off the presses of Robert Barker in the year 1611. That's an elephant folio pulpit Bible. That's what was first published of the King James Bible. We will give, we also have the smaller copies that are this in uh, a Roman font that's much easier to read. The, uh, the he edition, which had an error in Romans 3, not Romans, Ruth chapter 3 and verse 15, he went into the city, it should have been she went into the city. That first edition was corrected in all subsequent editions in Ruth 3.15. It's 15 years ago, an original would go for $400,000 plus. These are facsimiles to paper and to print and every single feature, covers included. To be like that original, you're welcome to look at it. The gunpowder plot. I sort of gave away one of the things that we're going to talk about going through this. It occurred on November 5th, 1605. That's 412 years ago. The gunpowder plot. It was in England. It wasn't in America. It was in England. What do these things have in common? These following things. The King James Bible, which I've just mentioned. The papal bull of 1570. Now the Pope is full of bull all years, but the papal bull of 1570 is referring to a proclamation that he issued for the nation of England. Extreme torture, English Parliament, bonfire night, Guy Fawkes, and gunpowder. These things are all connected, and when I get done in a few minutes, I hope that you can explain how each one of those fit in to the story tonight is his story, God's story. The gunpowder plot of November 5th, 1605. Sitting here on this King James Bible is a little bag that a loving brother of this church gave me that I keep on my mantle. Remember, remember, the 5th of November. And it's got a little surprise inside it. The gunpowder plot is the providence of God to save King James from a Catholic conspiracy to destroy the English government. It's also called and was known at different times in history because we're talking about an event 412 years ago, the gunpowder treason plot, Jesuit treason, Guy Fawkes Day, Pope Day, as it was called in America. Do you believe history is no more and no less than his story? Amen. God working in the affairs of men. Believe it, because that's the way it is. Do you believe these verses about kings? And he changeth the times and the seasons. He removeth kings and setteth up kings. Amen. He giveth wisdom unto the wise and knowledge to them that know understanding. He removes kings. He sets up kings. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. As the rivers of water, he turneth it whithersoever he will. Do you believe that? Yes. These are verses about our understanding of politics and of real authority. A king had the authority of life and death just with a word, even in our mother England, if she's the mother of some. For God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will. Their hearts are the kings of Europe, in Revelation 17, 17. For God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will. He will put things in the hearts of men to fulfill his will and to agree and to give their kingdom unto the beast until the words of God shall be fulfilled, till they had their time and space to make war against the saints of God, and then those nations took their authority back. Yes. King James, we dedicate this translation to you that you have commanded us, and we thank thee that by your writings you have dealt a blow to the man of sin that he will not recover from. That's in the preface of a King James Bible. It is an anti-Catholic Bible. Amen. Do you believe these verses about kings? And kings shall be thy nursing fathers, and their queens thy nursing mothers. They shall bow down to thee with their face toward the earth, and lick up the dust of thy feet, and thou shalt know that I am the Lord, for they shall not be ashamed that wait for me. When we wait upon God and submit to our government, 
The Lord will raise up nursing fathers and their queens to be our nursing mothers. Ezra wrote about the restoration of the temple in Jerusalem. Blessed be the Lord God of our fathers, which hath put such a thing as this in the king's heart to beautify the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem, and to pay for it with Persian taxes. Do you believe these verses about kings? And Samuel said to all the people, See ye him whom the Lord hath chosen, that there is none like him among all the people. That's not David. This is seven foot six inch Saul. There's none like him among all the people. And all the people shouted and said, God save the king. Amen. That's biblical. And Zadok the priest took a horn of oil out of the tabernacle and anointed Solomon. And they blew the trumpet, and all the people said, God save the king, Solomon. And Jehoiada brought forth the king's son, Joash, he's seven, and put the crown upon him and gave him the testimony. That's the word of God. If you've got the Lord's lineage, you put a crown on him, and you give him the word of God and wise counselors, and they made him king and anointed him, and they clapped their hands and said, God save the king. Amen. What is England's national anthem? God save, the king. God save the king. Since they don't have a king right now, it's God save the queen. The queen. So that's our surprise. Are you ready to sing a song tonight that we haven't sung before? Wait till you read these words. And recognize that the title itself and the whole concept is from the Bible. Don't feel bad that if it's better than ours. <laughs> Just be thankful. Now, do you know this melody? God save scriptural yes. there's Saul they shouted God save the king who is he William Tyndale he didn't live very long but the years he had did he ever use them well Amen. eight languages with perfect fluency He only lived to be 42 years of age. He put us to shame. He said to a bishop in England, challenging him about his desire to put the scriptures in the common language of England, which is English, if God spare my life, ere many years I will cause a boy who drives the plow to know more of the scriptures than you do. Yes. 
Is that true in our church right now? Amen. Do we have boys that could crush the old bishops of England? Or the new ones? They're the ones approving same-sex marriages. Right. William Tyndale. I want you to think about 42 years well spent. The first English Bible printed from the new presses invented in Germany. From Hebrew and Greek, he took them because of the fall of Constantinople in 1453 by the providence of God, driving all the Greek manuscripts out of the Greek empire, the, the remains of the Greek empire, into Europe. It was not based on Wycliffe's Latin. The first one with Jehovah in it. Our New Testament is 90 plus percent William Tyndale Amen. in the King James Bible. He was strangled to death and then his body burned at the same time at the stake. At his death, in a firm and fervent and loud voice, Lord, open the King of England's eyes. Right. He wasn't on English soil. He was over in Holland where he'd had to run to hide while he finished his translation and it was shipped back into the shipyards and we have a, we have a movie about it that some of you have seen where they pulled it out of those sacks of grain shipped into England. The, the Great Bible, which was Henry VIII order in 1539, notice three years after he died and said those words, Henry VIII ordered a Bible to end the Bible controversy, and then Elizabeth I did the same thing 29 years later with the Bishop's Bible. But they didn't work. But there were efforts made. It's a heritage that's unique in the world. Amen. Ordering Bibles to end Bible confusion, to have the right Bible and to have God's words in the common language of the people. Not in Latin, in the common language of the people. There he is, being choked to death at the stake before they burned him. Children, that's William Tyndale. He gave us our Bible. He was killed for the Bible. No one kills you for the Bible. You get to read the Bible because of him. They burned him. They killed him. He hadn't done anything except put the Bible in the language that you understand. Major English Bibles. John Wycliffe was before the Reformation. Don't ever forget it. 1382. Not the 1500s. 1382. Very influential with the Lollards. You can look up the Lollards in a Google search box. 1526 is William Tyndale's New Testament translation. Ten years before he died. He was working on the Old Testament, which is three times as long as the New Testament. Then there was Miles Coverdale in 1535. The Great Bible in 1539. Take, these men took from Tyndale so much of his effort. 1560, the Geneva Bible in Switzerland. 1568, Elizabeth's effort with the Bishop's Bible. And in 1609, the Roman Catholic Church, terrified of what was happening with all these Bibles proliferating, came up with their own version the Douay Reims version. Those are two cities where the New Testament first and the Old Testament later was put together and it was finally published in 1609. It was called the Anti-Reformation Movement, the Counter-Reformation Movement of the Catholic Church to counter what was being done by the scriptures being put in the common tongue. The Great Bible was the first authorized Bible by an English king in response to Tyndale's prayer, Henry VIII in 1539. Our Bible, we call it the King James Bible, but it wasn't called the King James Bible. He didn't want his name on it. It was called the Authorized Version because it was authorized by a king. The Bishop's Bible was an attempt at a second authorized Bible by an English queen, Elizabeth I, who hated Catholics and, and hanged, drawed, drawed, and quartered them if they were priests which is going to cost King James a little bit. And that was in 1568. We're in the 1500s. There she is, Queen Elizabeth I. The Queen Elizabeth that they have right now is Queen Elizabeth II. Major English monarchs, Henry VIII. Those are the years he reigned, 1509 to 1547. He wanted an heir. His wives wouldn't conceive. He liked lots of wives. He had six of them. He left the Roman Catholic Church and defied them. Even though he didn't change his church all that much, he left them. It made Rome angry. 
Edward VI reigned for those six years. He was a sickly young man and died at the age of 16 and gave the kingdom to Jane. Remember Lady Jane for just a few days? Because this queen killed her. That's Bloody Mary. Mary I of England for five years. 280 Christians hanged, drawn, and quartered. Elizabeth I reigned for 45 years and hated Catholicism. Then James I of England, our James, our King James. When she died, the kingdom went to her cousin from Scotland, the first Stuart to reign on the throne of England. And then his son, Charles I, who ended his life on a chopping block with, by Oliver Cromwell. Okay, that's how it fits together. Catholic. Protestant anti-Catholic. Protestant anti-Catholic. A compromising Catholic. This girl right here, boy was she brave. Amen. And for those of you that know about Lady Jane, it's a great story for young girls to know how courageous a 16-year-old girl can be with the threat of death. After Henry VIII and his six marriages and rejection of the Roman Catholic Church, and that's what Henry VIII looked like in one of his portraits, came Mary I of England, also known as Bloody Mary, for killing 280 opposing the Roman Catholic Church in her five-year reign. That's what she looked like in one of her portraits. Then came Elizabeth I, who reigned from 1558 to 1603 and was strongly anti-Catholic again. And there's her portrait again. Catholics hated Queen Elizabeth I for opposing Catholicism and changing the nation back to be anti-Catholic after Bloody Mary's five-year reign. So Pope Pius V ruled in 1570 by his papal bull that English Catholics did not owe her obedience at all. That is serious intervention in a nation when a religious leader with the power of eternal life and absolution of your sins tells its, his followers that you don't have to obey the government of the land. There he is in his triple crown tiara. Some say because he rules over heaven, earth, and hell. This was the papal bull of 1570, Regnans and Excelsis, ruling on high. That's what it means from the Latin. Zealous Catholics took this as liberty to hate and oppose Elizabeth I and her government. They didn't have to, they could try to depose her. The wild ones even said were justified in assassinating her. This effectively created a religious war with Elizabeth I persecuting Catholics to protect herself and keep it subdued in England. Such intervention in nations caused America to mistrust popes and Catholics. That's our tradition as a nation. I was a young boy in the late 50s and early 60s when President Kennedy was elected. No one thought that President Kennedy could be elected in America for one simple reason. He was a Catholic, the first Catholic ever to be a president of this country because we are an anti-Catholic nation by tradition, by heritage, not by practice any longer. Queen Elizabeth I, enemy of the Catholics, died in 1603. Who would be the next king of England? She died childless. Who will be the next king of England? Her cousin. King James VI of Scotland. He's always known as King James VI and the First because he's King James VI of Scotland. There had already been five Jameses before him ruling over Scotland. He was the sixth. He became the first James ruling over England. That's why he's King James VI and the Fifth. King James I of England, her cousin. Here are some pictures of King portraits of King James. King James VI of Scotland and the I of England.
There's his life. 58 years of age. And he reigned his entire life because he was made king at 13 months. His mother had been made queen at six days. People died back then because they were killed back then. King James I of England, and those are his years of reigning over England, 1603. He became king of Scotland at only 13 months when his father was killed, blown up. His house was blown up where he was staying by gunpowder at 13 months because his mother was implicated in blowing up her husband. You know, you can go home and type in anything and learn and read as long as you want on anything that I'm saying. Lord Darnley, this is Mary, Queen of Scots, not Mary Bloody Mary. This is Mary, Queen of Scots, the mother of King James, was implicated in her husband's death. She was imprisoned by Elizabeth I. He was the first ruler to be called the King of Great Britain because never before had the King of Scotland been the King of England. He united those two nations for the first time and Ireland. And in any official documentation like this King James Bible that you have in your hands, he's also called the King of France because that's what England did from about 1300 on. That's why they fought the Hundred Year War, because they knew they could take France whenever they needed to. And so they always called their kings the King of France. Anybody that is, fr is French, I'm sorry. <laughs> I just kind of like that little historical tidbit. They're always called the King of France. It says so right in, our, in the front of your Bibles, that he's the King of England, Scotland, Ireland, and France. English Catholics wanted James's mother, Mary, to be Queen of England because she was Catholic. James's mother was Catholic. And in a Catholic attempt to assassinate Elizabeth I, and Elizabeth I discovered it, had her killed. Mary, Queen of Scots, not Bloody Mary. When she tried to influence a takeover, Elizabeth I had her executed in 1587. King James VI of Scotland and I of England. He was born James Charles Stuart in Edinburgh Castle. His father was killed before James had turned one. His mother Mary was implicated and imprisoned. He was king at 13 months, and John Knox preached the coronation sermon for historical names. His tutor, very important person. When you have a king that's only 13 months old, do you know who's really behind it? Who's really pulling the strings? This man. 64 years old when he took the job, a strict Calvinist. Amen. James got up early every morning and learned and learned. And he learned strict Calvinistic theology. He learned the Bible. He learned languages. He learned philosophy. He learned how to be a great Christian. He learned how to be a ruler. Taught by this George Buchanan, and the results are what comes out in his works over here, like his Basilica Doron, which is his advice to his oldest son, Henry. Both were giants in intellect, knowledge, and thought. You remember when you read anything about King James, if you read it from the pen of an Englishman, it'll be slanted against King James because he was Scottish. You'll see it in a moment. If you read it by someone who was Scottish, it'll be quite different. The English didn't like the Scotch, especially when they're ruling over them. He took his throne to rule Scotland at age of 12. That's when he began to rule. James wrote a commentary on Revelation at 18. It's right here in front of you if you wanted to read it. He married Anne of Denmark when he was 23. He wrote Basilican Doron for his oldest son, Henry, Prince Henry, when he was 32 years old. Prince Henry did not live long enough, did not outlive his father. And so Charles, his second oldest son, became king in his stead when James died. He became king of England when he was 36 in 1603. He was the first king of America. He was the monarch of America because the settlers at Jamestown, Jamestown? I wonder where they got that name from. They were under King James the sixth of Scotland, the first of England. He had Catholic enemies, for he was anti-papist. A, pap a papist is someone who believes in the Pope. He was anti-popish Catholics. He had English enemies, for he was Scottish. 
All those English lords and the English rich and the English barons did not like this outsider coming in from that backwoods place up north called Scotland to rule England. He despised Catholicism and wrote against it, and it's in the dedication, if your Bible has the dedication of the translators to King James for the Bible. He was a sickly man with much physical trouble in his life. His oldest son died in 1612, Henry, and his wife Anne in 1619, so he had lots of troubles. His greatest accomplishment I haven't yet told you directly. You know what it is. There he is, King James VI of Scotland, King James I of England. This is what he gave us. The Holy Bible, containing the Old Testament and the New, meaning the apocryphal books are not Scripture. Newly translated out of the original tongues and with the former translations diligently compared and revised by His Majesty's special commandment appointed to be read in churches. Imprinted in London by Robert Barker, printer to the kings, an excellent majesty. To the most high, this is the dedication. This is, this is what it looks like right up here in the facsimile of the first edition, the Elephant Folio Pulpit Bible, 18-pound Bible that was first printed. To the most high and mighty prince, James, by the grace of God, King of Great Britain, France, and Ireland, defender of the faith, and so forth. The translators of the Bible, with grace, mercy, and peace through Jesus Christ our Lord. Great and manifold were the blessings, most dread sovereign, which Almighty God, the Father of all mercies, bestowed upon us the people of England when first he sent your majesty's royal person to rule and reign over us. And it goes on to describe their blessings under Elizabeth I and how they were thankful for her cousin, James. It's a great read. It's short. It's wonderful. The authorized version of the Bible, our King James Bibles. He was asked to end Bible confusion in January of 1604. He just became king of England in 1603. But this is called the Hampton Court when many religious leaders came together with King James and asked him for a new Bible, an exact Bible, and he agreed. And Robert Reynolds, a Puritan, was the foremost speaker for that Bible. By July, King James had appointed 54 of the best in the world. Forget the best in England. What other country would you go to? For Greek, Hebrew, and English. Latin, four. Some had eight. Some had 12 languages. There, I have bought some books recently because they're now out of print. And so if you take them, you must return them to our church library about the translators. Little biographical sketches of them. They were unbelievable. Unprecedented learning. And they had a whole flood of manuscripts that hadn't been available before from the overthrow of Constantinople, which is now Istanbul, Turkey. Six committees he arranged to do the translation and to check each other. And so there was checking and cross-checking between the, different, the six different committees. They offered their work in public for suggestions. You could go look it up during those seven years and see what they had come up with so far. Do you know how Bibles are done today? You don't know about it until it's on the shelf. It took these gifted men seven years to perfect it. Purified seven times. Don't take me too far on that. I just like the sound of it. Sometimes I might use the sound of the Bible, and I hope that there's some sense behind it as well. It is a perfect number. It is now called the King James Bible. It's scripture to us, and it's an English jewel, meaning it's the finest piece of literature ever put out by any nation and by the English nation. Tolerant to Catholics? Rome still hated King James, and he was. He wanted the nation to be at peace. He had written against Rome when only 18 years of age. He followed the reign of anti-Catholic Elizabeth, and he followed her more than he followed the Catholic Mary, Bloody Mary, the first of England. He did not follow his own mother's religion of Catholicism, Mary, Queen of Scots. So they hated him. He wasn't following his mother. He wasn't following Bloody Mary. He, was, 
He was following Elizabeth instead, and they did not like Elizabeth. He continued to write against Catholicism, which is noted in the Epistle Dedicatory. The translators knew, and they wrote this in their little dedication, the translators knew popish persons would malign their work of the King's Bible. Gentle to English Catholics at first to unite the nation, he revived Elizabeth I, recusant finds later. Recusant is Latin, Latin for a refuser, someone that refused to submit to the laws of England in religious matters because they were Catholic, because you had to go to a, a Church of England. If you weren't there, you were fined. And he restored those, because there was such open animosity between Protestants and Catholics then. Catholic conspiracy timeline. So here's what some of them, a few of them, decided to do. In 1604, January, King James had approved an exact Bible, which is our King James Bible. In May of that year, four months later, Daniel Catesby, the mastermind, the charismatic leader of these conspirators, conspired with four others. Where? What was said, all known, because they extracted every detail out of them on the rack. 1605, we've jumped a whole 10 months. A cellar is leased under the House of Lords in Westminster Palace, which was much smaller than the beautiful Westminster of today. It was much smaller. The House of Lords is where that body would meet and decide English law. The king would open it every year. The king would come in with his whole family, with his privy council, with all the judges, the head judges, the House of Lords, all the House of Commons would be there. They got a cellar underneath that building. It wasn't that big. They jammed in there for this special occasion where the king would sit in his throne and open Parliament. And they were going to blow every single one of them to bits. That's the conspiracy. They leased the cellar right under this room and building where they would be. The room, it wasn't really a basement, it was the first floor, because the second floor is where the House of Lords meant, the, the Lords meant, had seven foot walls of concrete. When dynamite is contained, when dynamite is contained in a barrel with steel bands, it exacerbates its power of explosion because it is held in place while the fire, dynamite just, and gunpowder, excuse me, gunpowder just burns. Gunpowder doesn't explode, it burns. But when it's contained, it can burn before and, and, and get all of it burning and then it explodes. If it's laid out, flat on the ground, it's just going to burst into flames. But when it's contained, now these barrels start the containment process, and watching a barrel of gunpowder go off is pretty exciting. And England's done a whole lot on this particular subject, and I watched a video last night of them reenacting the whole thing. They went to a military testing ground in England and built the Parliament House all over again with seven-foot concrete walls and put 36 barrels in it and blew it to smithereens. <laughs> they already knew because we know a whole lot more about the power of gunpowder measured in pounds and tons and what it can do. But they, they leased it into the House of Lords. So children, these Catholic conspirators were going to get the king, his wife, his sons, everybody. They were going to get what we would call Congress. Both houses of Congress, the House of Representatives and the Senators, they're going to get them all. They're going to get the judges. They're all going to be in one room. The kegs, are barrels, are going to hold the powder initially, and then when they explode, those concrete walls are going to direct it in one direction, straight up, and it was all wood. It was going to blow it into smithereens. They didn't even need half the powder. 1605, October. 26th, an anonymous letter was sent to a man saying, do not go to that ceremony. He was a member of the House of Lords, Lord Monteagle. He was a Catholic. 
So another Catholic warned him with an anonymous letter, do not go, because though there does not appear to be any opposition to the king, there will be a great blow struck. That Lord, for whatever reason, and you know what? We don't care what his motivation was, took that to the head of Homeland Security, <laughs> spy-in-chief Robert Cecil, who ordered a search on November 4th. November 5th is the opening of Parliament. At midnight, a search is made on the 4th of the basement of the House of Parliament. Whether it is spin, and there's, there's conspiracy theories because people don't want to submit to God's judgment. We don't care how it happened. It happened. Right. They found him there. They found the trigger man. They found the uh, wick man, the fuse man, the match man. 1605, midnight, November 4th. As it turns into November 5th, his name was Guido or Guy Fox, found around midnight. That's the conspiracy timeline. From May of 1604 to November, about 18 months, they had started to dig a tunnel. They did not know that they could just rent, easily lease the basement under the House of Lords, so they had started a tunnel with the same goal in mind of blowing up the House of Parliament. There he is. That's the best rendition that everyone in England knows exactly who this is. Right, Ed? Absolutely. That is Guy Fox. He was to light it. He was there. The others were racing to the Midlands, which is out in the countryside of England, to raise a small Catholic army to kidnap nine-year-old Elizabeth, King James's daughter, who was the only one not in, England, not in London, and they were going to put her on the throne with Catholic advisors and return the government to Catholicism. Because everybody, it'd be a complete vacuum. Right. These are all the conspirators. This picture is very well known in England. Robert Catesby, the mastermind. Guido Fox or Guy Fox. You know, whenever you say that guy, this guy, that's all from Guy Fox. <laughs> because you carry the guy out into the street and you burn him nowadays. You've, they've done it for 412 years. You take Guy Fox out and they're called guys. Well, you'll see. Father Henry Garnett, the leading Jesuit priest in England, was part of it. This is what the hall would have looked like with these men crammed in there. There's the king sitting on his throne. I'm sorry for the poor picture. These are the lords, wives and lords and house of commons, family up here behind them. Without a doubt, they would have all been killed. That was a wood floor, and it would have been, all the force would have been directed upward. There's an outside picture of the building, and I'm sorry that it is such a poor, well, it's not a picture, it's a drawing. There's the cellar. All this up here is wood. There are seven-foot concrete walls. There's a drawing of Guy Fox with the barrels of gunpowder under firewood. Catholic conspiracy details. Guy Fox had 36 barrels of gunpowder. That was plenty. He didn't need half that much. Daniel Catesby was in the Midlands to kidnap nine-year-old Elizabeth. Poor guy. Poor guy. He was caught that night and taken to the king's bedchamber, who interviewed him as to why he would want to kill the king and his family and children and women and everyone. And he was brutally disrespectful. I wanted to blow you Scottish beggars back to your mountains. I have verses for talking to a king like that in the Bible. Oh yes, they knew how to do it back then. King James wrote a letter, the letter is known, about using milder tortures to start. But if it's not successful, you know what to do. King James confronted him. He soon confessed all, but it did take several days. Several, I don't mean weeks. I mean three or four days. 
because they started with the gentler tortures. Other conspirators, once their names were out, were chased down and shot, or better. Better means to be hanged, drawn, and quartered. This is an English expression about a way to die. This is how traitors are supposed to die. This is an example of a rack. You can see the men with the leverage at each end stretching this guy apart and pulling his hips and shoulders apart. You tend to want to talk. Usually, just to be led into the room with the rack was enough. This is his signature before he was tortured. This is him signing his confessional statement. I think his body was a little messed up. I think that makes me happy. You say you're sick. Then God is. Then David is. You seem to have forgotten the verses, some of them that I've shared with you and some more that are coming up. Is the electric chair, lethal injection or gas, good enough for treason? Done in secret? Stupid idea. Foolish. It's done in private, and it's too easy. No one has ever done anything like that in the history of the world for someone guilty of treason, being a traitor against their own country. No, it's not even close to being enough. Hanged, drawn, and quartered. You're dragged backward on the ground, on your back, on slats by horses. Because you are not worthy to walk on the same ground as the other citizens, and you are not worthy to breathe the air that they're breathing at the six-foot level, so you are dragged on the ground. You are hanged naked in public on a short rope so that your neck doesn't break because they do not want you to die. There is a little boy sitting up on top of the gallows that unties them just before they die at the instruction of the executioners. You are hung and suffocated just short of death. Then you are dropped down, revived with water in your face, face and slapped so the next parts you are fully aware of. While living on your back, you are first castrated and it's burned in a fire that is prepared right there beside you that you are forced to watch and you are disemboweled. You are cut from nipple to navel and your insides are pulled out and shown to you and burned in a fire while you're alive. They were then finally quartered into four pieces and the head cut off and stuck on poles at prominent places in London for everyone to know this is what happens to traitors who speak and, and, and fight against the king. The severity of punishment was to match the treason. Here is a picture of them being dragged on the ground to the execution. You can see the, the uh, clouds. There's a man on the table. There's the little boy on the top of the gallows. He's letting another one down. This guy's on his back. He's being disemboweled. I know the picture is hard to see. There's the conspirators. This is a common page in England. There's the arm reaching in and disemboweling that guy. There's his head and so forth. There's another picture of it happening. There's the ax being raised to quarter them. Father Henry Garnet, the leading Jesuit priest in England, was party to the conspiracy and executed just that way on May 3rd, 1606. Are you shocked, surprised, or confused? You have never seen real power in America. This happened within just a few days, a few weeks, because they wanted to get a full confession to write a full report of what had gone on. Treason against a king deserves the worst suffering as a public warning. Right. It's what the Bible teaches. A Here it is. A wise king scattereth the wicked and bringeth the wheel over them. Right. The wheel gr was a rough wheel that was heavy that ground grain. And, and you bring it over, a you drive it over a wicked man and crush him to powder. Jesus said he would grind the Jews to powder. The fear of a king is as the roaring of a lion. Does, the roaring, does a roaring lion use lethal injection? Or does he rip you to shreds? A king does whatever pleaseth him. Ecclesiastes 8. David commanded his young men. These are two men who killed Ishbosheth, Saul's son that reigned in over the ten tribes for two years. David commanded his young men, and they slew them, and cut off their hands and their feet, and hanged them up over the pool in Hebron. Right. That's where it came from. Try this on sometime. 
This is David with the Ammonites. He brought forth the people that were therein, that is the cities of Ammon, and put them under saws and under harrows of iron. These are farm implements. And under axes of iron and made them pass through a brick kiln. The man after God's own heart. You say, well, God wouldn't do anything like that. No, he would do worse. And here it is. Let me share it with you. Well, we're not there yet. We're with Nebuchadnezzar. Anybody that speaks against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces, and their houses shall be made a dunghill. This is what God was going to do to his church if they rejected his word and his prophets. The tender and delicate woman among you, her eye shall be evil toward the husband of her bosom and toward her son and toward her daughter because she will eat her babies in secret, not sharing that meal with her children or husband. Here are the words. For she shall eat them for want of all things secretly in the siege and straightness of the judgment and besieging of Jerusalem. Right. And they did, and Josephus knew their names. Noble women ate their children in secret so they wouldn't have to share their baby with their other children or husband. We live in the most effeminate society ever on earth as far as authority and the lack of respect for it and what they can get away with. If you open up the Drudge Report or any paper or any news site or any, sit, any uh, news commentators on television or anywhere, the disrespect they show President Trump on an hourly basis is unbelievable. You didn't do that in the past. England has celebrated the King's salvation for 412 years. Remember, remember the 5th of November for 412 years. It's their number one state holiday, November 5. There's Guy Fox in effigy. That means they, they stuff clothing with straw and carry him around, then burn him. It used to be the Pope for 250 years. They've become politically correct now. They just burned Guy Fox, and that's a guy. And that's a guy. Because it's Guy Fox, Fireworks. There's a mask. They sell one mask for November 5th. There it is. Happy Guy Fox Day. And so there's lots of guys out doing this, fireworks and burning effigies of Guy Fox. Like that. It's the number one state holiday in England. There he is again. That's Tower Bridge, one of the most beautiful sites in London with the fireworks. Guy Fawkes Day. When by God's providence he was caught and he coughed up the other conspirators and they were caught and dealt with properly. Remember, remember the 5th of November, the gunpowder treason and plot. I see no reason why gunpowder treason should ever be forgot. Guy Fawkes, t'was his intent to blow up king and parliament. Three score barrels were laid below to prove old England's overthrow. By God's mercy he was catched with a dark lantern and lighted match. Holler boys, holler boys, let the bells ring. Holler boys, holler boys, God save the king. Amen. 412 years. I just got to add this one. Here's another verse of remember, remember the 5th of November. A penny loaf to feed old Pope, a farthing cheese to choke him, a pint of beer to rinse it down, a faggot of sticks to burn him. Burn him in a tub of tar, burn him like a blazing star, burn his body from his head, then we'll say, old Pope is dead. <laughs> now how's that for a nation song and nursery rhyme? This is a nursery rhyme. More about the celebration. November 5th is Bonfire Night, Fireworks Night, Goff, Guy Fox Day, Gunpowder Treason Day, as it was originally called. The Pope was burned in effigy and sermons were preached on that day, celebrating God's goodness to England in saving their king. And it was once called Pope Day in pre-revolution America, and it was very popular in the north. Boston area, very popular because so many of them had come from England and brought the tradition with them. November 5th, they called it Pope Day. This is England's most popular state holiday. Are you shocked and confused about such holidays? And I would preach on it on a Wednesday evening. Well, let's see if the Bible defends me. 
The book of Esther. At the end of the book of Esther, wherefore they called these days Purim, after the name of Pur. Pur is a Persian word for their lot that was cast and delivered the children of Israel. The Jews ordained that they would keep these two days according to their writing and according to their appointed time every year, and that these days should be remembered and kept throughout every generation. And so in March of every year, the days of Purim are kept by American Jews today to remember the days when they were allowed to go kill all their enemies in the Persian Empire based on the, na- the, the Persian word for a lot. And then we come to the New Testament, which is our chapter coming up next. Jesus was at Jerusalem in the winter, and he was at the Feast of the Dedication. That is not a Feast of Moses, that is Hanukkah. Right. That is the Feast of the Dedication of the Temple after Judas Maccabees delivered it from the Seleucid kings, especially Antiochus Epiphanes IV. In the New Testament, Jesus is there, and Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch at the Feast of the Dedication, a national holiday that was not prescribed by Moses. Can we see the providence of God? The authorized Bible project would have been ended under a Catholic government. The words and work of William Tyndale were fulfilled most perfectly with our King James Bibles. Not with that great Bible, not with the Bishop's Bible, with the King James Bible. Why and how and by whom was a letter written to Lord Monteagle? That anonymous letter. All kinds of ideas, and and some of them are fascinating. It wouldn't bother me a bit if Robert Cecil wrote it. No one hated Catholics in England more than Robert Cecil. That was the head of Homeland Security. Why did Lord Monteagle take the letter to Robert Cecil, head of national security? He was a Catholic. He had been written by a Catholic. Why did he expose a Catholic conspiracy? You say it could have been for selfish ends to gain points. He didn't gain points, he gained pounds. It was called 500 pounds a year for the rest of his life. How did they find Guy Fox and powder just hours before Parliament met? Guy Fox was born in 1570. This is one of my little favorites. The year of the papal bull. He was a Protestant because he had a very strict Protestant father until he was 16 when he became a Catholic. He served for 10 years fighting for Spain in Holland against Protestant forces. That's where he learned about gunpowder and munitions and blowing things up. 10 years a soldier for Rome, literally. The plague in London had delayed opening Parliament from July 28th, which may have compromised the gunpowder. It was a a damp first floor cellar type room. As the conspirators ran to the Midlands to raise a large-scale rebellion, no one would join them. All the Catholics they trusted in would not join them because of the terror known in every heart and mind of what happens to traitors. Raise an army? No one. When they made their last stand in a house, about five of them, surrounded by 200 local militiamen. Why did they, in their final house, their powder had got wet because they had, to, they had to ride a couple of days out of London in heavy rain. Their powder was damp. They laid their gunpowder out on the floor in front of an open fire. This is all true, and it burned them all. Now, they lived, but that's the bad part. They got to live. How did one bullet from one of those muskets back then this we're talking about 1605 do you know what kind of firearms they had back then 1605 how did one bullet from a militia gun kill number one and number two robert catesby and thomas percy how did catesby live long enough to crawl back inside the house to die clutching a picture of mary see that that pleases me (laughs) help us sinners at the hour of our death King James expanded on the divine right of kings to counter papal authority in Europe after this. The event kept an anti-Catholic spirit in England for about 200 years. This event, along with the Spanish Armada, disaster of 1588, don't let me even mention that, (laughs) built English faith in God. The Lord was very good, 
in destroying an invincible armada in 1588 along the northern coasts of England and Scotland. Was King James perfect? Most likely not. No. But that doesn't matter at all. God uses all kinds of men, and he even uses asses and ravens at times. Right. Was Pharaoh perfect? No. Joseph's Pharaoh. Was Ahasuerus perfect? No. Cyrus? Darius? No, these are pagan kings. Did they give some lip service to the Lord Jehovah? Indeed. Did they give some tax service? Yes, because God had said he would make them nursing fathers. King James persecuted Baptists. Because they, didn't, they weren't going to go to the Church of England either. Even killing a few. On one hand, but a few. He was head of a sacramental daughter of Rome. William, William Tyndale was not perfect. Only God is. Amen. And our Father in Heaven arranges everything for us and He is perfect. Right. Remember, remember the 5th of November. 1605, 412 years ago because we got that out of it. Amen. Let's sing one more song and go home. 598 in your red hymnals. When, when Prince William married Catherine a few years ago, this is the song they sang. Guide me, O thou great Allah. No. Five to eight percent of the population of England is Muslim now. They sang, Guide me, O thou great Jehovah. Amen. Stand with me and let's sing this to our God our Father. <coughs> Daniel? Guide me, O thou great Jehovah. Heavenly Father, songs of praises we'll ever give to Thee. There's only one King that we know is perfect, and it is Thy Son, the Son of David, not David, not Solomon, the Son of David, the Lord Jesus Christ. He is forever perfect. He loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore, You gave Him the oil of gladness above all His fellows, 
and you sat him down at your own right hand in the heavenly places. We thank thee for the Lord Jesus Christ, who rules the nations with a rod of iron, dashing them in pieces, moving them against each other, financing both sides of all wars for the glory of his own name and for the sake of his people. We thank thee for him. We thank thee for the word of God. We thank thee for William Tyndale and every noble ambition he had. We thank thee for King James I of England and every noble ambition he had for the word of God. We thank thee for those translators. We thank thee for thy providential care of our Bibles, that we might have the word of God in our tongue, and that you have delivered us from so great an enemy as the Roman Catholic Church and her daughters. Amen. We thank thee, Lord. Take us to our homes. Let us thank thee for the Bill of Rights and the freedom of religion, Amen. that there is no threat to our worship. We thank thee for the privileges, the pleasures, the prosperity, the peace, and the protection that we have. Have mercy upon us. Bless our church to be an outpost of truth and to spread it as far as we can. We thank thee for every bit of truth you've shown us. We pray for more. Lead us in paths of righteousness, wisdom, and truth all the days of our lives. And we'll thank thee forever through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.